it is unusual for the chair to speak at the same session, but uh, I'm going to move ahead now and talk about cardiovascular adaptation in female athletes. And I usually start with this slide, that participation in regular intensive exercise is associated with unique electrical, structural, and functional changes that promote enhanced diastolic filling, augmentation of the stroke volume, and the generation of a large cardiac output for prolonged periods. Of course, these adaptations manifest on the ECG and echocardiogram, and the ECG changes usually include bradycardia, repolarization changes, and voltage criteria for chamber enlargement. We see enlarged cardiac chamber size, increased left ventricular wall thickness, which is best appreciated on an echocardiogram and on cardiac MRI. But the magnitude with which these objective markers of cardiovascular adaptation manifest is determined by several demographic factors, which include the type of sport, the sex and age of the athlete, the size of the athlete, the ethnicity, and whether there are confounding factors such as anabolic drug abuse or even uh, an inherited cardiomyopathy on board. But I am going to focus predominantly on female athletes, and I'll, I'll tell you why we chose this uh, issue. We've, we've, got a, we've had a lot of data on um, athletes' heart, but it's almost all confined to male athletes. There are few data in females. And although females and males differ by just one chromosome, this one chromosome difference has loads of implications. It's associated with biochemical differences, physiological differences, anthropometric differences, and even psychological differences, all of which have an important impact on how one adapts to exercise. Females are generally smaller, they have a lower lean body mass, they have lower circulating androgens, and even a lower androgen receptor density in the heart. So they probably don't develop athlete's heart to the same magnitude as males. There has been one landmark paper on female athletes, which everybody quotes. It's the biggest uh, study of its type. I just want to show you this. I will talk about the study briefly, but this, this is an Italian study that looked at 600 um, elite female athletes. And from this study, we determined upper physiological limits of left ventricular wall thickness and cavity size in females and determinants of cardiac adaptation in female athletes. But this was a study that was confined to a homogeneous group of Caucasian athletes. This was published in 1996, and not very much has happened in female athletes' heart in terms of publication since then, but I do feel it is per pertinent today to revisit the female athlete's heart. Why is that? That's because the last 15 years has seen an explosive increase in the number of females participating at national level. In fact, if you look at the percentage increase in the number of national athletes in the past 10 years, in terms of percentage change, there's been a greater percentage increase uh, in female athletes participating. The second point is that females are now participating in events that were predominantly uh, a sport of males, such as football, rugby, and now even boxing. Like males, we, are, we have seen records being broken to an unimaginable level. If 15 years ago, if we'd have said that a female could run a marathon in, in you know, two hours and ten minutes, we'd have found it hard to believe, but that's, that's happening now. So it's important to study the female athlete's heart. The aim of my talk is to identify differences in cardiac size between female athletes and controls, to determine physiological upper limits of cardiac adaptation in females, to identify determinants of cardiac adaptation in females, to evaluate qualitative and quantitative sex differences in cardiac adaptation, and to finish off by studying electrocardiographic changes in female athletes. And what I've used, I have used the following studies, um, and any of you that, are, that would like this talk are, are welcome to come and take it off me later on, but I have, I have basically focused on Bjornstad's work on ECG, the large Pulitzer study that I've talked about, briefly the Enrikson study looking at the right ventricle, and really then the rest of it's just our work, me, Greg White, Jesh McCann, John Rawlins. So I think anything from 2002, most of the female stuff's come from our department. Let's start by talking about cardiac dimensions in female athletes versus sedentary controls. And this is a meta-analysis that was uh, written by Greg White, and he looked at uh, a 13, he looked at female athletes' uh, papers over 13 years, 
in, 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 and he only used studies that used a substantial number of athletes with controls. And we had a total of 837 athletes with 300 controls. These athletes were aged between 21 and 24 years, and they were divided into endurance trained, 53%, sprint and strength trained, 27%, and team game uh, athletes, 20%. And these are the left ventricular wall thickness between athletes in blue bar, in, 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 sorry, these are the wall thickness measurements between athletes and controls. Uh, the blue bars are the septal thickness and the red bars are the posterior wall thickness. And you will see that the athletes have a greater wall thickness than the controls. That's the first point to make. The second point to make, as this, this increase is not massive, it's only a 10 to 15% difference. And the third point to make is that the mean wall thickness measurements in female athletes are well within those of the normal population. Let's turn our attention to cavity size. So athletes to the left and females and controls on the right, you will see that athletes get a significantly larger LV cavity compared with controls. But again, when you look at the mean value, this value of 49.7, it's well within the limits for the general population. That this accounts to a 7% difference between males and females. So there is a definite uh, qualitative different, uh, change between, between athletes and controls. But, as I said to you earlier, that cardiac dimensions and ECG changes are governed by several factors, not just, the, not just sex, but also the size of the female, uh, the type of sport she participates in, and even her ethnicity. So look at, that, and some athletes are capable of developing very large cardiac dimensions. Let's look at the upper limits. And the upper limit uh, data comes from the Italian study of 600 athletes who trained for up to nine years and involved 27 sporting disciplines, predominantly swimming, roller skating, track events, gymnastics, handball, tennis, and alpine skiing. Here are the wall thickness measurements. Mean wall thickness of 8.9, controlled 7.2, the difference is 14%. A mean cavity in athletes, 49, controls 46 the mean difference is 6%. So women do get a change, but not a big change. Let's look at the distribution of left ventricular wall thickness in females. The only one thing I want you to take away from this slide is that Caucasian females do not develop a left ventricular wall thickness of 12 ever. In fact, in my experience, I have never seen a Caucasian female with a left ventricular wall thickness of more than 11 and I would uh, put to you that a wall thickness of more than 11 in a Caucasian female should uh, lead to a suspicion of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Things are slightly different when we look at the left ventricular cavity size. This is the histo uh, histogram showing the distribution of LV cavity size. You will see that 8% of females develop an LV cavity of more than 54 millimeters. This is a cavity that exceeds the upper limits of normal for the general population. But only 1% exhibits a cavity size of 60, which would be consistent with the sort of dimensions that we see in dilated cardiomyopathy. So some females can get very large cavities, but only a small number get a cavity of more than 60, but even then, never more than 66. That's the largest cavity size recorded in females. What about determinants of left ventricular uh, dimensions? Well, age does, so does size sporting discipline and ethnicity. And I'd like to uh, address these one after the other. Here are age, body size, wall thickness measurements and cavity size in women, uh, sorry, LV function in women who had cavities of more than 54 versus those women who had normal LV cavity size. You will see that women with a big LV cavity were older and were larger than females with smaller cavities. There was, no, there was also, obviously, if they're larger in size, they're more likely to have a higher or a larger LV wall thickness. Let's look at the comparison of left ventricular wall thickness and cavity size amongst athletes in relation to training. The meta-analysis by Greg White found that athletes participating in endurance and team sport had greater wall thickness measurements than those who were strength trained. If we look at the... Uh, type of sports that generate the biggest LV cavity size, it's predominantly the endurance sports such as rowing and cycling that are associated with the largest cavity size in female athletes. What about age? Here are two histograms looking at LV cavity size in adults at the top 
and adolescence at the bottom. And you can see that both adolescents and adult athletes do develop large cavity uh, dimensions, but you can see that the adults, 8% have a cavity size of 54 millimeters, whereas only 1.5% of adolescents have an LV cavity size of more than 54. But that's not surprising. Adults are usually larger, they're physically more mature, they're able to exercise uh, harder, and they've usually been exercising for longer periods. So the one thing I want to take away from this slide is that in adolescent female athletes, very few develop LV cavity dimensions of more than 54, and we have not been able to demonstrate an LV cavity size of more than 56 in any adolescent female athlete. What about ethnicity? This is a bar chart showing you wall thickness measurements in 240 black female athletes and 200 white elite athletes in France and the UK. These are all national athletes. The white athletes are in the red bars and the black athletes are in the blue bars. The take home message is that black athletes develop greater wall thickness than white athletes. That's the first take home message. The second take home message is that 3% of black athletes develop a left ventricular wall thickness of 11, but never more than 13. So based on this histogram, a wall thickness uh, uh, of more than 11 in a Caucasian female is abnormal. A wall thickness of more than 13 in a black athlete is abnormal. What about comparison of females with males? It's not surprising that females have smaller cardiac dimensions than males. This is a bar chart showing you left ventricular wall thickness measurements in males who are blue and females who are red. You'll see that whereas males can exhibit wall thickness measurements as large as 16 millimeters, we never see anything greater than 11 in females. And this is the same with adolescents. The, these are, the males are in the red bars, the females are in the blue bars. Uh, sorry. It should, it, should, it should have been the other way around. I think the males, uh, the males were in the blue bars, the females in the red bars. You'll see that none of the females actually develop uh, wall thickness measurements beyond 11. Similarly with cavity size, we find that whereas eight, only 8% 8 of females uh, develop an LV cavity size of 54, 47% of males get cavities of this magnitude. Whereas only 1% of females develop LV cavities of 60 or more, almost a quarter of males can develop these types of cavities. So we do see big hearts in athletes, but when we see them, they're almost always in males and not females. What about ECG changes? We know that people who exercise exhibit certain ECG changes which represent vagotonia and increased cardiac size. The vagotonic uh, changes include bradycardia, first degree AV block, and repolarization changes, and, the, and athletes often exhibit criteria for LVH. Here are ECG changes between controls and athletes. You will see that our athletes have uh, slower heart rates, they have a longer PR, and that, that, should, have, that, should, that should be the other way around, actually. They should have a longer PR interval. They've got higher criteria for RVH and LVH, and they also exhibit more um, repolarization changes than control. So female athletes do exhibit qualitative changes similar to males when you compare them with controls that they get more bradycardia, they get a higher uh, proportion of LVH on the ECG. If you compare them with males though, males get greater durations, they have greater amplitudes, and they have higher indices of LVH. And this is our data comparing, uh, several, uh, comparing 2.7 thousand uh, males versus 440 females, and we find that males get more bradic uh, they get that the that males get more bradycardia, they get a higher proportion of right bundle branch block, which in my eyes indicates RV enlargement. They have a higher prevalence of LVH by threefold and a significantly higher prevalence of right ventricular hypertrophy compared with females. What about repolarization changes? We find that um, this, some of you who, who study sports medicine, and sports medicine and sports cardiology will think it's very strange that a large proportion of our female athletes had T-wave inversions because we hardly ever see T-wave inversions in females. But I should point out that our population was very heterogeneous and included a lot of black females as well. We find that nevertheless, whether you look at blacks or whites or a combination, T-wave inversions are much more common in male athletes than female athletes. Deep T-wave inversions we don't see in Caucasian female athletes. 
And when we do see them, we only see them in black athletes, and even then, they're only confined to the anterior precordial leads. So the take-home message here is that deep to have inversions do not occur in female athletes. When you do see deep to have inversions, you find them only in black athletes, and they are only confined to the anterior precordial leads. So deep to have inversions in, in, in the lateral leads in any athlete is abnormal. And this is just data comparing black females and white females. You see that white females have T-wave inversion, 2%, all minor T-wave inversions, versus black athletes who have T-wave inversion in 14% of cases, again, only confined to the anterior leads, as you see on this ECG. So in summary, females do exhibit a qualitative cardiac adaptation response similar to males, but in absolute terms, females exhibit a lesser quantitative response compared with males. Age, size, high dynamic sports disciplines and ethnicity are important determinants of LV dimensions. Older athletes, larger athletes, athletes in endurance sport and black athletes get more LVH than uh, other athletes. A wall thickness more than 11 is abnormal in a Caucasian. Uh, a wall thickness of more than 13 is abnormal in a black female. Female athletes show similar ECG changes to males but with, with a lesser degree, the prevalence of LVH and repolarization changes are significantly lower in female athletes than male athletes. Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. Uh, I have never come across a female athlete with a wall thickness of 12 or 13. Um, and, and so if I did, I would have to go out of my way to be sure that she does not have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I rely very heavily on the ECG, and it's very unusual, certainly in a female, to show that magnitude of LVH without any ECG changes. But we do know that about 5% of people with HCM have normal ECGs. So what I would do in this situation is try to look for the broader HCM phenotype, and I would do that with MRI, looking for late GAD enhancement or areas of hypertrophy that we haven't noted. I would do an exercise stress test to look for a flat blood pressure response, which is a feature of HCM. I'd do a halter to look for non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, which is another feature of HCM. And if I could, I'd like to see the first <coughs> relatives, the parents and siblings, to see if we've got any evidence of HCM. If despite these investigations, I cannot identify HCM, I would let her compete, but I would make sure that I see her on an annual basis. Do you think um, when we relate the wall thickness to the body dimensions, for, for example, body surface area or weight, we would be more sensitive to detect pathology earlier? That's a good point. And uh, there are people I know in this audience who have done a lot of work on scaling um, um, cardiac dimensions uh, in relation to body size. You're speaking to a very simple Simon cardiologist who at the moment relies on absolute cardiac dimensions. And I think until we've got some standardized criteria looking at individuals with disease processes and physiological processes, uh, then we may be in a situation to have some of these data. But I'm sure you're absolutely right. I mean, that uh, it, accu the, mo the more accurate uh, method of doing this is to standardize wall thickness measurements and cavity size measurements in relation to size of the athlete. But uh, we need these standardized data out there in the cardiology literature to be able to apply them. As a simple physiologist, we often um, avoid testing females because they're highly complex. The, uh, the influence of the menstrual cycle on blood volume or indeed the circulating hormones might indeed change some of the uh, values you've been looking at. Would you care to comment on the, uh, the influence there? Well, I've, I've not really thought about that in detail, Rob, but I would be surprised if uh, a slight increase in the concentration of estrogen would change someone's LV cavity size or wall thickness. I can only tell you that because we are currently studying uh, pregnant women. Uh, and uh, we're doing a very different study, of course. We're not looking at athletes, so I may be comparing apples with pears. But what we have found that when we take people about six or seven weeks after conception, 
and follow them up through pregnancy with three monthly echoes, we're not seeing a massive change in LV size or wall thickness. So I could only use my pregnancy model to answer that question. Could you just comment on how quickly the changes occur following, say, the initiation of training, or if you detrain, how quickly would you expect the, the changes which you've observed to decline back to normal? I, again, I can only comment on the detraining side because there are very few studies that have looked at, prospectively looked at uh, females and how quickly they develop changes. But the, the, the data set is that anyone who trains intensively for 12 weeks or so should, at, at VO2s of 85% um, plus, should develop cardiac changes. In terms of detraining, and I'm only giving you our experience, we find that the ECG changes resolve within six weeks. So not as long as the sort of data uh, that was published by Esani and Marin et al. That these changes do occur quite quickly. Do you think the use of oral contraceptives, the long-term use of oral contraceptives then would have an influence on adaptations in females? Appreciating menstrual cycle as well as pregnancy are kind of normal, lifelong changes across the female lifespan. Again, I've been very guarded in the way I've responded to these questions. And I think uh, in this world of transparency, I'd have to say, I don't know. I would be surprised if the oral contraceptive uh, pill has an impact on cardiovascular adaptation in females, but I am no expert in uh, female um, endocrinology, as my wife will vouch for, because uh, um, um, I can never understand how she's going to behave towards me each morning. Uh, but uh, I'm sure, is there anyone in the audience here, I know there are lots of sports scientists here, very well-to-do sports scientists, who may have done some of this. Anyone got, a, got any? Keith? You're the sort of person that knows about females. No impact at all. Well, we've got, we've got someone saying no impact with the oral contraceptive pill. Okay, I think I'd better escape before I get any more difficult questions.